we um, get started. So uh, let's let's start by reviewing just for a second where we've been, particularly with Walter Hilton, because we're making this shift now from one of the ways that we grow spiritually, this organized uh, understanding. And Walter Hilton introduced to us the purgative way, the recognition of our inclination towards sin. And I like the word inclination because it's just this sort of underlying mysterious way that we just drift towards sin. And he talks about getting ascendancy over our emotional reactivity. And what's so interesting about Walter Hilton, how you can take this um, this mystic from the 1300s, and he matches exactly modern day family systems therapy. Uh, it's just, I mean, words, phrases, structures, it's exactly the same. Uh, and Hilton wrote that many a man has virtues only in his reason and in his will without any spiritual delight in them or love for them. So we often do the right thing, but we do it out of duty or we do it because we know we have to or out of peer pressure. And what Hilton says is that the growth in the purgative way is, um, is what the colic says, uh, to, to obey the Lord and to love doing it. We know what the Lord commands, he says, but we don't love to do what the Lord commands. At this point, um, he would say, when we get to that part, when we know what we're supposed to do and we do it, but we don't particularly love doing it, we don't see the reason in doing it, we are reformed in our faith, but not in our feelings. And he says our emotions still need to be redeemed. And we need to become less emotive and more willful in seeking God. Uh, Zach last night, while I was trying to finish up my sermon, thought it was really funny to, um, to play. It was you, it wasn't Zach, it was Jesse who did it. Jesse was playing some guy praying in tongues. And it was just horrible, but it was an emotional, emotive thing. Now, that's not what praying in tongues usually is. But this guy, um, Zach says that if you look, I've got the thing I haven't looked at, that he was reading his cell phone while he was praying in tongues. I think he was not real. You think it was real? Well, uh, Hilton, Hilton wants us... To, yeah, he was, looking, he was reading his text messages while he was praying in tongues. Um, so what Hilton would say that we need to move, instead of praying uh, for sort of these immature, temporary, immediate, desperate prayers, we are motivated more as we grow by the experience of grace to desire God to more and more have our identity fashioned into the image of God and pray in a way that's congruent with God. In fact, what happens with the mystics is they don't say much at all. They just become filled with God's will. Uh, the Holy Spirit really working on them, Hilton would say, and regenerating them from the inside out, cooperating with the Holy Spirit. Uh, he says we should cooperate with the Holy Spirit by subjecting our wills to God, making our wills vulnerable and available to be redeemed, remade, reordered. From ourselves at the center, and see how prayer fits into this, if our prayers are always using God, as I call, a celestial bellhop to do the things we want him to do, to change the created order into the way we would have made it if we were God, to change the things going on around us, uh, then we are at the center of our prayer. And what Hilton says, we need to move from ourselves at the center of prayer to God at the center of prayer, from our disordered emotions to an orderly, non-anxious, peace that passes understanding, image of God restored within us. Hilton describes this as when reason is turned into light and will into love. 
Uh, he says we have ascendancy then over our emotions. Uh, no longer are we victims to our raging reactivity. We are no longer about what we feel, but by what we mindfully desire. And that is to be in the presence of God, to be in communion with God, to actually reflect our, created, uh, our creation in the image of God. Um, so this is the, the purg pur uh, purgative process uh, toward a converted and redeemed self, but it is tough work, Hilton says, and we sometimes, and sometimes we do not feel, he writes, a grace working within us. So we wonder if our baptismal regeneration has taken effect. We still have pangs of guilt. Our passions are not always under control. We are still inclined, but much less so towards sin. And even as we work through that and complete this purgative way, we still despair in the long, dark nights of the soul, and that is when we enter the illuminative stage. Uh, we despair and wonder if any of this is ever true. So we start to doubt our faith, and so we need something to sustain us, and that uh, is where the illuminative stage begins, um, when uh, our emotions are under control, we're pretty much uh, loving to do what God commands, and yet, and yet we wonder, and yet we still catch ourselves up, um, and we need that long process of sanctification. Uh, well, this is when Julian of Norwich enters, um, actually on uh, June 13th, 1373 is where she enters the stage at age 30, uh, and she was uh, laying sick in bed, uh, looking at a crucifix on the wall in the hospital across from her. And so she has these very clear conversations with God, and we're going we're gonna to read, she calls these conversations showings. And, uh, and she had 16 showings. We're going to read one of them, uh, what she calls the revelations of divine love. Uh, Julian was an anchoress, and an anchoress was a person res restricted to a small dwelling, sort of like I'm restricted to the old beer cooler in this building. Um, but the advantage the anchoress had is they had a window, so they could actually see outside as opposed to being time-capsuled in the beer cooler, uh, the way we are here. So, and through that window, they give spiritual counsel. Um, and, um, and this is important. Julian understood these showings to be actual teachings, not, and this is important because this is one of the things that Walter Hilton moved us away from, not private, personal ecstatic experiences where she showed that she was spiritually more mature than everybody, but they were teachings given to her uh, to be used for all people to be moved toward greater love for God. She believed a spiritual revelation is not for individual use and uh, what we might call personal aggrandizement or spiritual elitism, but something to be used for the common good. Although Julian thought these to be for everyone, she is clear that everyone is defined, the everyone for whom these were formed, uh, were uh, defined as those who will be saved. So, she says, God showed me no one else but those who would be saved. Um, now, this was really congruent with the medieval teaching of the church, um, and most of the time they simply did not address that question. Uh, she saw her work nevertheless to be for, as she says, such men and women as for the love of God hate sin and depose them, dispose themselves to God's will. Now, isn't that the purgative stage? That's exactly that first stage, the purgative stage, and she introduces then these revelations that are illuminative uh, to help us work through that process once we've made the initial movement whereby uh, for the love of God, 
we hate sin and uh, dispose ourselves to God's will. So um, uh, these are not these are not uh, her. She thought that her teachings or her showings were not for people new, just seeking conversion, uh, nor even for the newly converted, uh, nor for the incurious or the spiritually undisciplined, but for those who had lived the faith and now wanted to make progress. So we get Walter Hilton, who's uh, really beginner stuff. Now Julian, who's graduate levels, I mean, uh, undergraduate stuff, and then we'll move into with the cloud of unknowing graduate level uh, Christianity. Um, and it, it's for, as she wrote, uh, those who wanted to be free of sin and the attraction to evil and to experience union with God to the furthest degree possible in this life through prayer. So the illuminative way is for those needing a vision of hope to persevere in that process through, uh, to persevere through the impatience, the discouragement, the despair that comes along in the Christian life um, that serve to undermine our faith and uh, sort of uh, worry, make us worry about our progress, our lack of progress. Um, it is a despair or doubt of faith that she says makes one wonder if it is all true. God's love, God fidel God's fidelity, God's intentions working on us. Um, and, and she said, um, these are triggered, these thoughts are triggered as we look at ourselves in light of our created image, uh, coming to realize what moral and spiritual failures we are. In other words, the more serious we are about the faith, the more convicted we are about how we do not measure up to the image of God. And that uh, what Julian says is that causes us a certain amount of despair and doubt uh, when we realize what moral and spiritual failures we are. So this level of humility that the lessons call for this morning uh, are certainly important. Here's what she writes about this. She says... When we begin to hate sin and to amend ourselves according to the laws of Holy Church, there still persists a fear which hinders us. By looking at ourselves and at our sins committed in the past, and some of us because of our everyday sins, because we do not keep our promises or keep the purity which God established in us at our baptism, but often fall into so much wretchedness that it is shameful to say it. And the perception of this makes us so woebegone and so depressed that we can scarcely see any consolation. So that's, that's actually entering. Um, it's always uh, interesting to me. One time I had a person who wanted to do counseling here and they had just finished their bachelor's degree in psychology. Well, that's just enough to make you think you know what you're doing. And you've got to get an MSW or something like that to realize how much you don't know and how much you need to listen and learn. See, in other words, it's a, it's a greater step forward not to think we know anything, but to realize how little we do know. And that's what Julian is saying here. Um, so, how can we maintain a posture and attitude of hope? That's what the illuminative way is really about. Julian's answers involve countering, uh, involves countering the ignorance of love with the revelations of divine love. That's actually the phrase she uses, that we counter our ignorance of love with these revelations, these showings of divine love. This is not just a matter of just believing and all will be well. We need to actually deal with those stumbling blocks, really confront um, what we do to make our lives miserable. Julian believes we learn the great depth of God's love by the avoidance of pain, but by actually living through pain and despair. Now that's quite contrary to our popular culture where we don't believe in any pain at all. I mean, why do we have an opioid crisis in this country? Because nobody even wants the hint of pain anymore. 
or any suffering or any understanding of reality. Julian says, you've got to go through the center of pain to get to where you need to go. So she discerns and creates the, a theological worldview that actually considers divine goodness and the existence of evil. In other words, she's, she's really addressing the issue. Why does God allow sin? Why does God allow evil? Those are her two big questions. If God is the ultimate cause of all things, is God also the author of sin? St. Augustine answered this by saying, sin is the absence of good, and Julian thought that to be uh, the right answer. She says, God is the author of that which is, not that which is not. But why does God tolerate it? Why did God not avoid its suffering consequences? Why did God allow sin in the first place? And so in this way, she reverts back to her showings. Christ said to her in this showing, sin is necessary. Sin is necessary for growth. But in the showing, uh, Christ says to her, sin is necessary, and this is the sort of famous phrase connected with Julian, uh, sin is necessary, but all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Uh, and so you'll hear people say that all the time, all shall be well. And that's a specific theological phrase. Um, this is her encouragement, a showing of divine love. There is something useful in sin's aftermath. It can induce self-knowledge. It can break down pride, force dependence on God, which is the goal of the spiritual life. The spiritual journey is dependence on God. Um, so uh, she finds sin, although not created by God, that God uses it for his purposes, uh, by which we can come more clearly to know ourselves, uh, come uh, to break down our pride and force our dependence on God alone. We somehow come to God in whom all will be well through suffering, through love that doesn't work out, and through death. And all this becomes clear within the struggle in what she calls dialectical prayer. Now, see, I love Paul Tillich, which all the evangelicals go crazy about. How could, look at Mike wincing over there. His, yeah, see. <laughs> It, 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 his seminary, they hated Paul Tillich. No. In my seminary, they... Oh, you didn't hate anybody. That's right. You just <laughs> thought he was wrong. Yeah, something like that. We'll talk about that. Well, it was your dean, John Rogers, who got me to read Paul Tillich. So, um, yeah. How's that? <laughs> These are inter-seminary things. Um, <laughs> Paul Tillich talks about a theological dialectic, and what Julian talks about is a prayer dialectic, where we actually bring all these, we don't come to God, uh, we don't come to church just that we're perfect and holy and everything's wonderful. Uh, that's why we have a confession where we talk about being miserable offenders. We come to God in knowledge of who we actually are and who he calls us to be, and in that dialectical prayer, uh, there's a communication uh, to take, uh, that takes place in which we uh, come to trust um, both, we come to be in awe of God and to trust God, and that is increased. And as that is increased, so is our spiritual life increased, because then we're able to be vulnerable and to be converted and transformed. Um, this is tremendously an important mind and finally uh, revelational experience. Our encouragement, Julian says, um, is God in his secret ways making all things well within us as we enter that dialectic. So what I'd like to do uh, right now, because I think this is really um, fun to see, is I'm going to pass these back. These, this is, I think it's showing number 16. Maybe not. I can't remember. 
This is one of Julian's show-ins. And, and I'm going to read it, and you can follow along with it. And then we'll interpret it. And it's interesting, I think, because it's a real challenge. It, it, it kind of gets you in your craw, and it doesn't... Um, well, we'll read it, and we'll see what you think. This is the parable of the Lord and the servant. Now, this is not a parable of Jesus. This is a parable that comes out of one of Julian's showings of Christ, Christ's showings to Julian in her prayerful dialectic when she was sick. Um, now, the, the, you've got to understand that Julian of Norwich is really highly accepted in the church. She's not a flake of any kind. This isn't some weird thing that I copied off of Joel Olstein's website. This is actually, yes. Oh, she's just, she's just been this contemplative person who gets sick and, uh, and has, excuse me? Yeah, she, well, she's just in her little room, in her little cell. And they feed her in there. And she was thought to be somebody of spiritual wisdom, but then has these show-ins. And, and, um, and people really do um, find great comfort and spiritual direction. I mean, that's the purpose of her showings. They're insights from her. You know, you didn't live that long. And you, had to be, you had to get with the program back in those days. And uh, uh, this, these showings happened in 1373. Well, they just didn't. Uh, women could be. Uh, women could learn and write. They just couldn't tell men what to do. It's before we lost control of the whole thing. And now we're quite at ease with reading Julian. I think she, I think she mostly had just little old ladies coming to see her, you know. It was, I, think she, I think she was the mother of altar guilds. <laughs> so let, let's, uh, let's look at this. A gracious Lord answered in showing very mysteriously a wonderful illustration of a Lord who has a servant. And he gave insight to my understanding of both of them. For the first was thus. I saw two persons in bodily form, that is to say, a Lord and a servant, and with this God gave me spiritual understanding. The Lord sits solemnly in repose and in peace. The servant stands near before his Lord reverently, ready uh, to do his will. The Lord looks upon his servant most lovingly and sweetly, and humbly he sends him to a certain place to do his will. The servant not only goes, but he suddenly leaps up and runs in great haste because of his love to do his Lord's will. And immediately he falls into a deep pit and receives a very great injury. Then he groans and moans and wails and rise, but he cannot rise up nor help himself in any way. In all this, the greatest misfortune that I saw uh, him in was the lack of reassurance. For he could not turn his face to look back upon his loving Lord, who is very near to him and in whom there is complete comfort. But like a man who was feeble and witless for the moment, he was intent on his suffering and waited in woe. I watched deliberately to see if I could discover any failure in him, or if the Lord would allot him any blame, and truly there was none seen, for only his good will and his great desire were the cause of his falling, and he was, a, he was as willing and as good inwardly as when he stood before his Lord ready to do his will. And in the same way his loving Lord constantly watched him most tenderly. Then says this gracious Lord in his meaning, Behold, behold, my beloved servant, what harm and distress he has received in my service for my love, yea, and because of his good will. 
Is it not reasonable that I reward him for his fight and his dread, his hurt and his wounds and all his woe? And not only this, but does it not fall to me to give him a gift that is to him better and more honorable than his own health would have been? It's a pretty gripping story of God and us, is it not? You see, the chief source of the servant's pain here comes from his inability to see his Lord. And that is what Julian is addressing in, spirit, in people's spiritual times of trial, when they feel the most distant from God, when they feel this great despair, and like they've been let down, their inability to see him. And like all of us in despair, we cannot see at times God's love for us. And so what's implied here is that is the greater gift that, be, that, that can be given. Not the, not the pulling the person out of the immediate uh, pit they've fallen into, but the vision of God's love for them. Um, we see from God's perspective in this showing that in seeing us, God sees only his beloved son. See how graciously he saw his service servant. God, uh, and this is the importance for Julian about this was that God looks at us as if we are in Christ, not as if we're fallen into the ditch, but as he loves us and gives us that love. God sees us even right this minute, not as we come to him in despair, seeking a way forward, but he sees us as if we've attained the end goal, sanctified, glorified, and sinless. And in that, our fear of his wrath disappears. Julian writes this, and for the great endless love that God has for all mankind, he makes no distinction in love between the blessed soul of Christ and the least soul that will be saved. That's how God sees us. So if we wonder how God sees us, he sees us with that kind of grace and love. He sees us as having done what we were supposed to do, uh, to be good and faithful servants. And that is not, you don't get a special merit badge for that. Uh, that's just what God expects. And God already sees us that way, sanctified, glorified, and, and sinless. Um, but I, I think you see how in this there's so much reflection that can be done, and yet how biblical and congruent with Christianity uh, it is. Um, Julian uh, Gatta, who, who, as I said, spoke at an Anglican Institute conference and, and I think has a way of uh, condensing these people in a way that um, you, you can read all these things, but I, I like to use Julian, I mean, uh, Julia Gatta, not Julian. Uh, Julia Gatta is sort of a guide. Um, she, uh, she, says this, um, she says this, as the occasion for deepened humility and trust in God, sin is indeed necessary. Those anxieties about the damage done by sin that first prompted Julian's theodicy dissolve in this parable's eschatological look at the end of times, a vision in which even in sin, God works for good with those who love him. So, as St. Paul says, uh, what, what we look for, where our hope is, is not focusing on the sin, not focusing on the torment. I mean, there's very little focus on the torment that this guy is in here, but looking at how God will use it for his good purposes, how God will use our sin to make us more dependent on him how God will use the things that befall us to make, him, make us look not to the immediate, but the long-term goal uh, of union with Christ in his kingdom. So we've got um, five minutes after that to, uh, for questions and maybe some answers. Uh-huh. 
See, so in our, in our tradition, one of the things I, well, here's one of the things I found about crusade. Yeah, I, I know that's their theory, but it's a forced, it, you go for the weekend, and so you give up a weekend, and, and you go from beginning to end in three days, and you're fine. It's sort of like getting a steroid shot. Huh? They have a fourth day. Well, I was thinking about it this week. So, so, so um, years ago, Keith Stanford, who was here at the 9 o'clock service, called me up and said, uh, would you come to my office this morning? And I said, sure. So I go to his office, and he said, um, I need to give you a steroid shot in your ankle. And I said, okay, why? And he said, well, I, I just, it, it needs that. And so, okay, so you gave me a steroid shot. And I said, why did it need it? And he said, well, we're going skiing together tomorrow, and I don't want to listen to you moan and groan about your ankle all day, so I want to get it fixed today. <laughs> and a steroid shot will fix most everything within 24 hours. Um, but but the, tradition, the tradition in our church is this long term, uh, before I moved here, to Colorado where we don't have any money to do these sort of things, I used to go uh, to uh, Boston to St. John the Evangelist for a week at a time for that kind of spiritual retreat where it's silent, reading, praying, meeting with a spiritual director. And it's a long-term thing that goes on year after year after for your whole life, which is a lot different than a four-day And I found the three days so miserable, I was glad I didn't go to the fourth day. I had gotten my ticket punched with the three days. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it is, a Cursillo started in the Roman Catholic Church, and it fits their way of doing things. Anglicanism is more along these lines of studying and reading um, the, the mystics of the church. So anyhow, yes, yes, there, there is, yeah. Uh, N-O-R-W-I-C-H. So does everybody get what's going on in their soul about this? So, it, so just look at, uh, look at, yes, Anne. Yes. Yeah, Julia Gotta, who wrote, who's written kind of like, I think, the best book on this, the most easy to grasp, although it's still difficult to grasp. Julia Gotta, G A T T A, teaches it at Princeton, I think. Um, it, she spoke at an Anglican Institute conference. She's written a lot of books. Uh, Julia Gotta. But the person we're talking, and Julia Gatta is alive and well, and a mother of three children now, and is a, married to a man, Episcopal priest. So she's okay. All those, she's, she's done all the things right. So, um, but then Julian of Norwich is, uh, is the um, anchoress who had these 16 visions. And, and their visions like that, and you can see how biblical they are, but they draw these things out that are really quite amazing. Read this one over a number of times. And he's in the same time he, he's in the same time frame. What other what, let's see, we're in the middle of how it works. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't know what process she went through, because all the study about her, the are the show after these sh little's known about her before all of a sudden these showings popped up, <clears throat> and and then. They were just around more in these communities, and in the community, some people had 
the job of bankers and others have the job of uh, growing the vegetables for them to eat? It's what? Who's our anchoress? Um, Marge Goss. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, so Julia got us teaching at Swanee now. Oh, okay. She's at the seminary at the University of, South, of the South at Swanee, where our daughter went to undergraduate school. Um, so, th so this process, you see, is one of, uh, as we try to make process, progress in our Christian life, uh, Anglicans have dealt with this love in a wonderful way because we've really spent some time thinking about what is actually sin and what is not. And, and some Protestant denominations get off into all these little things and they make a big deal out of them and it's not necessary. There are better sins to worry about in our heart and mind uh, than dancing, for example. There are just better things. We have more egregious thoughts and feelings and angers and resentments that grow up in us than that. Uh, and so, we'll, but no matter how far, how often we say our prayers and read morning and evening prayer uh, and work on our life, we still have this sort of emotional reactivity to things. Um, and, and we don't like things. A and we express ourselves about that and then we feel guilty about it. Well, I'm a Christian, I shouldn't behave like this. I'm trying to be more in, in the image of God and I'm not making much progress. And, and so that happens all throughout this process of the purgative way. And then we get, we get to the point where we're actually doing pretty good. We love to do what God commands. We see the value in living our life uh, in God's creation, on God's terms. And we work towards that, but sometimes it just gets uh, it, there's a despair in us as we still stumble and fall. And so these showings are um, a way to have a vision, an eschatological vision, a vision of more important things at the end of time, things that, uh, that pull us through that. So then we begin to look at like this particular showing where we see that, that rather than being all involved in the despair of falling into this pit, if only he could have seen the love of his Lord, his heart would have been warmed by that. And then he would have had the courage and the strength to do something about his current problem. But his current problem is so overwhelming while he's in the ditch that he can't think of anything else but moan and groan about the current problem. Uh, and if he has a greater vision and the encouragement of the love of his Lord, then um, I don't know if he's able to climb out of the ditch, but his despair greatly decreases because he's got a longer view of things. Um, he's not worried. Ken, Ken Emery talked to me about somebody who's really not doing well this morning and how they're so concerned about somebody else. Really, that's how most people are. We, as we grow in our faith, we're not concerned about ourselves, we're concerned about others. So the older that we get, the more we worry about um, what are our grandchildren going to do if we're not there to tell them what's right to do. You know, that's what, those are the kind of things we worry about. Um, so what, uh, what Julian does, and we'll, and we'll go more into Julian, not next week or the following week, but the week after we pick back up with Julian, and, um, and we'll be able to see how this illuminative way works the right things in our heart to transform us into our closeness, our presence, uh, our life in God's presence, where God is, uh, is with us and we experience him with us all the time. And, and the important thing about Julian at this point is the way that we are viewed, that, that the Lord looks lovingly on his servant. And see, the Lord looks lovingly on us and part of our despair is we feel like we're not making any progress when in fact the Lord's already looking at us as if we've succeeded. It's, the, it's, it's in our doing, uh, in our working toward that which will not be completed 
until we're made perfect in Christ at the general resurrection. You see, that, that's when that will all be completed, completed. But the Lord is already looking at us uh, as if it's completed. So when we plead to the Lord, the Lord has already forgiven us. All that's already forgiven. It's like Robert McLeod said in his sermon a couple weeks ago. Um, it, we're, we're already forgiven by Christ's death on the cross. That's, that's accomplished. So now what we are, are we judged on? What we did with the life we led as forgiven people. That's what we're judged on. Sins, taken care of, gone, over. They've been gone for 2,000 years before we even committed them. Now what do we do with that forgiven life? And that's what Julian helps us to see, the forgiven life. Okay. <laughs>